Hello and welcome to the latest installment in the Law & Order video series. In this video we'll be looking at the puzzle adventure horror game Bendy and the Ink Machine from Joey Drew Studios. I absolutely love this game, everything from the level design and aesthetic down to the voice acting and the story. It had everything you could want from a game. There will be spoilers in this video, so if you haven't played the game and you want to, I'm not sure why you'd be watching this video but you now have been warned. A man called Henry enters a cartoon animation studio called Joey Drew Studios, for which he used to be an artist and he was the co-founder of it. He's been invited there by his partner, Joey Drew, who states that he has something that he needs to show him. Henry explores a derelict studio littered with cardboard cutouts of a character called Bendy, and then Henry discovers a hidden ink machine, but after turning it on it produces a malicious version of Bendy, known as Ink Bendy, which chases Henry. Just before he makes it to the exit, he falls through the floor. After clearing a path for himself, he stands in the middle of a ritualistic symbol on the floor, sees some visions and passes out. Henry awakens from his involuntary slumber and makes his way through the lower level of the studio. Henry sees a person carrying a cardboard cutout of the character called Bendy, but when he follows him, it appears that the man has simply just disappeared. After having to solve some puzzles of a musical variety, Henry is confronted and tied up by the man that he saw before, who is called Sammy, and Sammy mentions that someone or he will set them free. Henry is then chased by Ink Bendy. He manages to escape but is spooked by another character from the studio called Boris. After taking a rest inside of Boris's safe house, Henry awakens and he and Boris leave the safe house in the hope of finding a way out of the studio. It's dark, but with the use of a flashlight, they manage to find their way out. Boris journeys through a vent in order to open a door so that Henry can pass through. He ends up in a room with a sign which says Heavenly Toys. Passing through this room, Henry ends up in the toy room for a character called Alice Angel. An advert for Alice Angel plays on the screens and after it finishes, a twisted evil version of Alice Angel will start shouting from behind the glass. Henry has a choice of taking one of two paths, the angel or the demon. After a spooky encounter with a bendy cutout, Henry reunites with Boris, who gives Henry a pipe in order to defend himself and they find an elevator. After hearing the twisted Alice speaking to them over the speakers, the two of them ride the elevator to level 9 as instructed to do so by Alice. They see a lot of Boris clones dead having been killed by Alice. Alice gives Henry various tasks that he must complete for her in order to escape. However, after completing these tasks, Alice betrays Henry, accuses him of stealing from her and causes the elevator to plummet to the depths and after it crashes she kidnaps Boris. Henry awakens after the elevator crash and finds Boris gone and sets out in order to save him. After making his way through the studio archives and after witnessing a pretty cool fight between Ink Bendy and a character called the Projectionist, Henry journeys through a haunted house. Travelling merrily along in his cart, Henry hears Alice speaking over the speakers and tells Henry she has a surprise for him. This surprise is Boris, now seemingly having been turned into a brute by Alice. Henry eventually defeats brute Boris and Alice turns up annoyed and just as she is about to kill Henry, she is stabbed from behind by a lady called Alison and a man called Tom. Henry wakes up again, this time he is in Alison and Tom's hideout. Alison gives Henry a piece of glass which shows hidden messages written on surfaces. Eventually, Alison mentions that Ink Bendy has found their hideout due to Tom doing something incredibly foolish, and Alison and Tom leave Henry for dead. After using the glass to help him escape, Henry makes it to an old barge and he has to sail through the ink filled tunnels until he reaches safety. Henry isn't safe for long though, as he is attacked by Sammy, but Tom comes to the rescue and buries the axe into Sammy's head. After a massive fight with some enemies called Searchers, Henry leads the way but falls down a hole after a wooden board collapses. Henry eventually reaches a film vault and meets up with Allison and Tom again, who explain that just beyond a door, which Tom duly punches open, lies Ink Bendy's lair, located inside a giant version of the ink machine. Upon approaching his lair, Ink Bendy turns into Beast Bendy and after a battle, Henry manages to defeat him by using a film reel titled The End. Henry then seemingly arrives in the apartment of Joey Drew, who tells Henry that he needs to visit his old workshop. Henry goes through a door and is right back where he started in chapter 1 again. Then the game ends. So again, there's a lot to discuss here, but we'll start by discussing my theory on what's going on. This game has a lot going on in terms of lore outside of the game. If you do have a different theory, put it down below, I'd be keen to hear your take on the game. 
few books were released off the back of the game. On the 30th of July 2019, the Joey Drew Studios Employees Handbook was released. Months later, a novel called Dreams Come to Life came out on the 3rd of September 2019, and the sequel to this has just come out actually titled The Lost Ones. Just before The Lost Ones though, on the 2nd of February 2021, The Illusion of Living was released. We'll be referencing these works at various points in the video in order to paint a better picture of everything that happened and to find out a bit more about certain characters in the game. Started in 1929, the Jerry Drew studio was a success. Well, it was in the first 15 years or so, but we'll get to that. The company was started up by Jerry and his friend Henry Stein, a talented artist. Despite Jerry taking full credit for the characters that the studio designed in his book, The Illusion of Living, Henry was actually the visionary for them and he was the one who designed them. This is reinforced by that secret message in the lobby which states that Joey drew nothing. All Jerry cared about was wealth and success. He likely saw Henry's talent and saw dollar signs. This was refuted by Nathan Arch Sr, owner of Archgate Films, in the reissue of Joey Drew's book The Illusion of Living released after Joey had passed away, where he states in his foreword that certain untruths have come to surface as well as rumours and backlash which in turn fueled public suspicion that Joey Drew was not actually the genius that he made out to be. Need I mention that Nathan Arch and Joey were friends since childhood? But make of that what you will, I know where I stand on it. Anyway, in the same year they started up, they released Little Devil Darlin, their first cartoon which featured the first of Henry's creations, Bendy, a character that would go on to help sell US war bonds. Bendy was also heavily advertised as well, hence all of the old Bendy cardboard cutouts around the studio. That same year, Henry's second character, Boris, a friend of Bendy's who tried to keep him out of trouble, joined the lineup and he featured as Boris the Wolf in the cartoon Sheep Songs. These two cartoons brought great success to the company, but Joey naturally wanted more. In 1930, Henry designs Alice Angel, and she makes her first appearance three years later in Sent From Above. Alice Angel didn't do as well as the other two, but due to the continued popularity of Bendy, Joey starts up a subsidiary of Jerry Jew Studios and creates Heavenly Toys. Around 1930, Henry decides to leave the studio and spend more time with his wife Linda. Henry just wasn't happy working there due to Joey taking and never giving anything back. He only lasted a year at the company. You see, working at the studio wasn't all that great. Due to Joey being so focused on money, the work conditions were appalling. He had a high staff turnover, many staff would leave or would be fired. In the employee handbook, it states that overtime is frequently required in order to keep up with deadlines, but the staff wouldn't actually be paid for that overtime as they were salaried. He set up an infirmary in the studio so that staff that were sick could still do their work whilst ill. Oh, and they only got five days of paid holiday per year. Don't use it all at once. Anyway, in 1935, the studio created The Butcher Gang and Bendy has a run-in with them in the cartoon titled The Butcher Gang. Joey, being the money-hungry, <coughs> ambitious person that he is, decided that he wants to cash in on Bendy's popularity by hiring famed theme park designer Bertram Piedmont to design something called Bendyland. He bought up some land and as we can see here, Bertram was spending a lot of money. But in 1944, the company is now in big trouble. They are under investigation by the IRS for non-payment of back taxes, but Joey Drew vehemently denies this, claiming it's just disgruntled ex-employees or their rivals. However, two years later on from that, the company starts failing to pay its employees. The highest outflow in this month, as you can see, was money spent on special projects. The truth of the matter, though, is that Grant Cohen, head of finance for the studio, informs Joey of his concern that his goals and visions were bigger than the financial capacity of the company. It's clear that the studio is in bad shape. Joey Drew is desperate for the studio not to go under, so he attempts to try and revolutionise the industry not so much to save his company, but so he can make even more money and continue living his lavish lifestyle. One of the special projects that Joey had commissioned was the design of an ink machine. This ink machine was a breakthrough in artistic technology. In the employee handbook, it states that this machine was designed to pump out high quality ink throughout the studio and was also to be used to create life-size productions of anything they could think of. The ink from this machine could be collected and placed into a contraption called an ink maker machine in order to make gears, pipes, wrenches, anything really. Now quite what sort of magic or sorcery is making this happen is unknown. According to this recording, one of Jerry Drew's motivations was belief. 
that belief can make you achieve your dreams and for him at least, means him becoming rich and powerful. At some point in the 1940s, Joey teamed up with Gent, more specifically one of their engineers, Thomas Connor. Over the months in designing this machine, Thomas, or Tom, would report back to Gent. However, Tom became concerned that Mr. Drew's expectations seemed to be changing regularly. He mentions that what started as a machine to make life-size items out of ink has now turned into something else teetering on the verge of magic. Eventually they did finish it, and the idea was that it would turn 2D sketches, i.e. comic strips or drawings, into physical 3D models. Kind of like a 3D printer. At some point, as mentioned earlier, some magic was involved. Joey was wanting to bring the creations to life, and this was his big chance. Now, it's not clear yet what this magical force is, and it's more likely on the side of the occult, judging from the ritualistic symbols that we see around the studio. Ink would be inserted into the machine, but something would happen to the ink on its way through the machine, churning out a magic and quite malicious substance. According to the novels by Adrian Kress, it is almost as if the ink would move around, as if it was sentient. In the Lost Ones novel, one of the characters, Bill, mentions that something in the ink is trying to grab him, likely the searchers who just seem to pop up from inside pools of ink. On Tom and Jerry's first attempt, they tried to create a 3D version of Bendy. This backfired though, and for some reason, according to Tom Connor anyway, Bendy seemed off, like he was a soulless being. This creation of theirs had a creepy grin on its face. Joey Drew was worried that it would scare off the investors, so he had Tom dismantle it and leave it in the research and development offices. But unknown to them, they have birthed something horrible. A monster. A demon. An ink demon. As the dismantled Bendy lay on the side, one of the employees working on Bendyland, called Lacey Benton, would become paranoid that it was moving when she turned her back. The rejects, or basically the failed products of the ink machine, were called the Lost Ones. These ones just became a mass of black ink and yellow glowing eyes. Many of the old staff members of the studio would have likely ended up as Lost Ones. The successful creations, I guess, were Norman Polk turning into the projectionist monster, Alison Pendle becoming Good Alice, Tom Connor becoming a counterpart of Boris the Wolf, a, a clone if you like. There were the various Boris and Butcher gang clones, but I don't know who they used to be. The ink machine would pump ink throughout the studio via pipes. Tom Connor relayed concerns that the piping wouldn't be capable of holding the ink's pressure, and lo and behold, pipes were bursting regularly. Much to the dismay of Wally Franks, the janitor, who had to clean it up all the time. Employees started to get suspicious of this machine and the mysterious ink, until one day a gopher called Buddy and a writing intern named Dot decided to investigate. They found out that the ink had created an ink demon, and as a result they attempted to drown it in ink underneath the stage. To do this they had to damage the machine. Buddy got dragged down with the ink demon though and came out different, but we will get to that. Buddy can see his human, dead body laying on the floor, and Joey Drew appears. Mr. Drew blames Tom for the machine and the creation of Bendy, saying that Tom led him astray. Mr. Drew mentioned that there was something missing, Ink Bendy didn't have a soul, and that was the missing piece in his creation. Mr. Drew says that Buddy gave him the soul he needed for his creation to come to life, and that Buddy's purpose was to save Bendy. Buddy realises that his purpose has to be protecting the world from the Ink Demon and from the machine. Buddy becomes Boris and runs away and hides in the studio. He is Boris the Wolf, whom we meet in the game. Due to the machine being broken, Tom is instructed by Joey Drew to take the machine to Atlantic City, where it will be repaired. I can only assume that after this, the ink machine ended up back at Joey Drew's apartment, as we can see it in his garage at the end of the game. But did Joey have a separate one built? A bigger, better one? Because the one we see in the game is way bigger than the one in Joey's apartment. Also, this letter here from Alison to Joey, she states that Tom is still mad about someone stealing one of his dusty inventions from the studio. It's obviously the ink machine. But anyway, let's, uh, let's talk about Sammy Lawrence. Sammy Lawrence was the music director at Joey Drew Studio. He was an award-winning composer and musician. He created the scores, the sound effects, recorded the voice actors and actresses. He oversaw pretty much everything in that regard. He worked hard and was by description pretty cranky, and we see him in the game like this. But how did he end up this way? Well, we have to dive into dreams come to life in order to find out. Remember before I mentioned Buddy, the gopher for the studio? Well, just after he'd started working there, he had to deliver something to the music department. 
and Sammy walked in, covered head to toe in ink. He was literally choking on the stuff. He managed to regain his composure and took Buddy over to the closet in his department. Sammy told him that he was looking in there, and remember I mentioned the pipes and the pipes not being able to withstand the pressure of the ink? Well, the pipe burst all over Sammy. A few days later, Buddy had to take him something else to the music department, and Sammy had a half-empty bottle of ink next to him. Buddy walked away, but turned back to look at Sammy and the bottle was now empty. But Buddy noticed a spot of ink by Sammy's mouth. Turns out later in the novel that Sammy was indeed drinking the ink. Eventually, Sammy was just as much consumed by the ink as he was consuming it. He began to worship Ink Bendy, even at some points referring to Bendy as his saviour. In the game, he tried to provide Henry as a sacrifice to, in his words, free his body from the inky prison it was trapped inside. Sammy appeared to meet his end when Tom hit him around the head with an axe, and he simply dissolved away. Alice Angel was a new addition to the friendship of Bendy and Boris. Her character was designed with the idea that she typically tried to foil Bendy's attempts at causing mayhem, but there's sometimes a bit of confusion as there are two Alices in the game. There's a good Alice and a twisted Alice. The studio initially hired an actress named Susie Campbell to voice the character. However, this didn't last long as Joey decided to replace Susie with another voice actress called Alison Pendle. Joey mentions in his staff memo that he is taken with her beautiful voice and that he likes her because she is different. Joey then had Alison re-record all of Susie's lines. Susie, of course, didn't take this line down. She eventually began referring to herself as Alice in voice notes. She mentions here as well that Joey Drew wishes to meet with her as he has an opportunity for her and he takes her for lunch. Susie Campbell, judging by this image of a coffin with her name on it, died and her body is in there, but her soul is trapped inside the twisted version of Alice Angel, and Twisted Alice would harvest from dead clones of Boris and the members of the Butcher Gang in order to try and maintain her beauty. She was killed by good Alice after Henry fought with and defeated brute Boris. During her time working there as a voice actor, Alice and Pendle struck up a relationship with Tom Connor. I believe this was a massive disappointment to Jerry Drew, who I think was attracted to her himself. In one memo to his staff where he mentions that he is taken with her voice and charm, and at the bottom, it says it's to be distributed to all staff apart from Susie Campbell. Now, given that Joey is quite erratic and judging by the language in his letter, effective immediately, he hadn't even told Susie about the change. She had to find out the hard way. It's clear Alison got the job because Joey was sweet on her. This is further strengthened when you see the wedding invite from Tom and Alison for Joey Drew. Joey declines to attend. Anyway, Alison and Tom moved on, and it's revealed at the end of the game that Alison is still writing to Joey after all those years, and she's now working for Archgate Films. Right, so we've already discussed what kind of man Joey Drew was, a man who would step on someone else just to reach his goal. In his memoir, The Illusion of Living, Joey writes about his upbringing and his secretive past. Born in 1901, Joey grew up in Patterson, New Jersey. His father was a shoemaker and opened his own shoe store, but Joey didn't want to work in the family business. The family was poor, but they never struggled to live. When he was young, he asked his mother how his father manages to get the shoe orders out on time, and she replied that the shoe elves help him. One night, Joey snuck up to his father's workshop, and true to what his mother had told him, he heard elves chatting. He poked his head round the door, excited, but it was actually his father who was making the elf voices. His father explained to him that he gets lonely whilst making the shoes, so he creates these voices to keep him company. This sparks something in Joey, and he now believes that fantasizing and make-believe actually make people's lives better. Later in life, Joey joined the military and fought in World War I. Joey was too young to enlist, but he lied on his form. Joey was also a man who would shaft other people regularly in order to make people think highly of his genius, even if he had nothing to do with it. He tried to take credit for Ben Gland when Bertram Piedmont designed it and built it. Right in front of everyone. High level investors, Wall Street tycoons. The ever tactless Joey Drew introduces me, the great Bertram Piedmont, as Bertie, like I was his child. He called him Bertie in public in a way that belittled him and eventually threw him out and turned him into this. Another example is an argument between Tom and Joey Drew in the Dreams Come to Life novel, where Tom states that Joey stole his machine from him, that the machine was his life's work. 
Fun fact, Tom was actually fired by Joey Drew in this argument, but of course, in the most Joey Drew way possible, he hired him again when he realised that the ink machine was busted and needed repairing. And this is how the machine ended up in Atlantic City. Joey Drew clearly holds a grudge against Henry after quitting the studio, but we all know the real reason he's angry. Henry isn't around to make Joey money off his designs anymore, because that's what Joey does. Joey uses people. Henry saw it early on and managed to get out. Joey even goes as far as to blame Henry for not pushing him towards the correct path, instead of letting Joey head towards the crooked empire that he was building. You were always so good at pushing, old friend. Pushing me to do the right thing. You should have pushed a little harder. As we know, he left the studio in order to spend more time with his wife, Linda, and they moved to Pasadena in California. This is why, at some points, Joey makes digs at Los Angeles. Joey hadn't found an artist as good as Henry since he'd left the studio. So when young Buddy came along, despite Joey Drew putting a freeze on all new hires due to money concerns, his eyes lit up. This kid was desperate for his dream job being an artist. And according to this, Joey thrives on people that are desperate. 30 years after he left, in 1960, he receives the invitation and the letter from Joey Drew, asking him to come to the old workshop as he needs to show him something. And this leads us to the start of the game. So I do not know for the life of me how I keep ending up picking games with loops in them, but well, this one is no different. It's a loop or the cycle as it's more specifically known. Henry is trapped in an endless loop. He wakes up in Jerry Drew's apartment, Joey tells him to go and visit his old workshop, and bam, he's back in the workshop again. At first I didn't consider a loop until I received the glass tool which reveals hidden messages. Upon revisiting the workshop for a second time, we can see tally markings by the entrance, which I guess would indicate that Henry has been here before, many, many times before. There are other clues in the game, such as Twisted Alice stating that Henry never dies, Henry recognising Alison's song, and the glass screen states that Alison will leave Henry for dead, which she does. Another one is that at the end, Joey mentions to Henry that he's back so soon and that he didn't expect him for another hour, and that he must have questions like he always does. Which makes me think that this has happened before. In Joey Drew's apartment, Henry looks around the living room and sees some sketches of moments that happened in the game. This is strange. What's more is that on the corkboard, there are various letters from Joey's ex-employees. Allison and Tom, Wally Franks, the studio's janitor who'd moved to Florida. Did Joey send a letter to everyone to lure them back into the studio and trap them all inside a loop? The thing that's still confusing and pretty much unanswered is this. Is this just a story that Joey wrote into existence with the help of the ink machine? I guess the game is published under the name of Joey Drew Studios. It's possible that the game is a story written by Joey Drew Studios about Joey Drew Studios. Tell me another one, Uncle Joey. Or has he simply managed to trap his ex-employees in the real-life studio into a loop, which resets the moment that Henry kills Ink Bendy? The two novels didn't really tell us much. They only really gave us a bit of backstory about the characters and how they ended up the way they did. But I did actually thoroughly enjoy the novels. There is another game plan for release at some point, Bendy in the Dark Revival, and I hope we'll find out why and how Henry and all the other characters are stuck in a loop. Those of you like me who read the novels will probably be wondering about the fate of the characters from those novels. All day I've been wondering what happened to Dot, what happened to Bill Chambers, to Brant, and to Constance. What happened to the other people that Buddy worked with like David, Jacob, and Richie? Given that the second novel is titled The Lost Ones, I'd imagine they were turned into Lost Ones or even into one of the sacrificed Boris or Butcher Gang clones we see in the game. With a new game on the way and a potential protagonist called Audrey in the promotional material, many are speculating that this could in fact be Dot, as at the end of the second novel, she was wounded by Ink Bendy. She managed to get away, but we don't know what happened after that. But also, if Jerry Drew died in the 60s, are the others still stuck in a loop? Did they ever manage to get out? What's more, why did Joey Drew do this? Was he really that bitter that he couldn't just let these people go on and live their lives? We won't know anything else now until either another novel is out or the new game drops. But that is it for this video. If you did enjoy it, please leave a like on it and subscribe to the channel. Leave a comment below on your thoughts and theories, but for now, take care and I'll see you in the next one.